Right, good evening everybody and welcome to our, our webinar, a coastal one for a change instead of the bush. So welcome, people are still coming in. So um, we'll, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, let's start off slowly. Um, the usual house rules, please, questions in Q&A um, and uh, chat, just to chat to everybody. Um, we are live streaming on Facebook, so you can watch on Facebook and put your questions there. We will we will monitor them. Um, and right, I am now going to start. It looks like the numbers coming in have slowed down. So welcome, and and welcome to our our speaker tonight, Dr. Anna Westhazen, who lives in. Port Elizabeth, so she just told us she, um, for the last 15 years, she's worked in the marine co in marine conservation as the Sand Parks Marine Expansion Coordinator within the Park Planning and Development Unit, which is based in Port Elizabeth. She has a PhD in fishery science from Rhodes University, is a research diver, and has worked on octopus and chocker. She serves on several national scientific and marine management working groups. NA is particularly passionate about developing our marine ranges who are at the coalface of marine conservation. This is done through the West Indian Certification of Marine Protected Area Professionals, Professionals Program. So now we know who's talking to us. NA, welcome and please switch on your video and you're welcome to start your presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction. Give me a moment to get my presentation up. Here we go. Right, you're live and ready to go. Great. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, and very, thanks very much to the honorary rangers for inviting me here tonight to um, share some of my experience with you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you about how we develop and plan marine protected areas. And um, sorry, there we go. Um, and as some of you probably already know, um, the government declared 20 new marine protected areas in 2019. Um, and this, uh, this was under the Operation Pukisa project. Um, and this increased our marine conservation estate in South Africa from about half a percent to over 5%. Uh, and this was about almost 70,000 square kilometers. So it was a huge, huge win for marine conservation in South Africa. Out of those 20 new MPAs, um, three of those fall under the Sandpass mandate, and you can see them there on the map, it's the, the Namakwa MPA, Robben Island, and Addo. And these three new MPAs more than doubled South, uh, South African National Park's conservation estate, from about 150,000 hectares to about 370,000 hectares. Um, so really a big win for us. So generally, when people ask me, what is an MPA? We say, well, it's, it's like a national park in the sea. But when you want to plan or develop a national park, it's fairly easy. Um, you can go and buy a farm, or you can contract a farm in. You can fence the farm in. Um, you protect your animals. You can fly over your reserve count your buffalo and your rhinos, your trees, etc. It is slightly different in the marine environment. Um, of course, we can't buy or own any of the sea. You can't fence in any of the animals or, or fence the people out. And it's very difficult to access. You can't fly over it and observe or just go for a casual walk or drive and record your species. So how do we conserve the sea? And um, this is the process that I'm going to be talking to you about tonight. So when I started this job, um, I thought it was going to be a fairly easy process. 
how to plan an MPA 101. Um, you go out, you gather your scientific data, you feed your data into your conservation plan, um, and then you declare your MPA. Of course, this is not how it works in reality. Um, and reality goes a little bit more like this. You collect your data, you talk to stakeholders. You collect your social data, you talk to stakeholders. Uh, you do a conservation plan, you talk to stakeholders. You get my drift. So there's a lot of talking um, in between the doing in planning an MPA. And um, after talking some more, talking to the government, in the end, if you're lucky, you might get a gazetted MPA. So I'm going to use Addo Elephant National Park MPA as an example tonight to talk you through this process. And for those of you who are not lucky enough to reside in the Eastern Cape, here's just some context to, um, to the place and the space that we'll be talking about. And I'm sure as honorary rangers, at least you will know the Addo Elephant National Park. This is all the green bits that you can see here. The city of Port Elizabeth is over here. Um, on the eastern side, we have the coastal villages of Cannon Rocks and Bockness. Um, we have the Kucha Development, Industrial Development Zone, or Special Economic Zone, as they call now, on this side of the, of the MPA. We have Sunday's River, and of course we've got the island groups, which is the St. Croix group right here next to Kucha, and the Bird Island group. So just to give you a bit of context here, yeah, this is about 80 kilometers across and about 20 kilometers at its widest. So you can see it's a, it's a substantial area. So um, at our MPA, in Algoa Bay sitting quite a complex socio-ecological system. As I've mentioned, it's got Port Elizabeth, a city of over a million and a half people on the one side. It's got um, coastal villages on the other. It's got two ports. It has an industrial development uh, node. It has several commercial and recreational activities that's marine-based. Um, Port Elizabeth is also considered the water capital water sports capital of South Africa um, and we have many international events that take place here. So it's a complex system to be working in. One of the questions I get regularly um, is why Algo Bay? What is special about it? Why do we need to conserve it? Well, it's a biodiversity hotspot along the coast. We have the highest percentage of endemic lionfish, seaweeds, and invertebrates along the whole South African coast. Um, and this is because Algoa Bay sits between two regions, um, the colder Western Cape region and the warmer subtropical Natal region. So many of the species thrive um, and occur in this temperate environment of Algoa Bay. Uh, I've mentioned the islands. These are also very important. They're the easternmost islands of the South African coast, and they form important habitats around the island um, itself, but they are also important bird areas. So St. Croix supports, well, between St. Croix and Bird Island, they support the largest remaining breeding colonies of the African penguin. And on Bird Island, we have the largest gannetry in the world. So these are really significant islands. Then, and in the background, you can see the dune field. We have the longest productive coastal dune field with Sandy Beach in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it's important because the fresh water from the dune aquifers seep out into the surf zone, um, which drives diatom blooms, which forms the basis of the productivity in Algoa Bay. So a really, really productive and biodiversity hotspot. So when you combine this really rich marine biodiversity with an estuary in terms of the Sunday's estuary, 
and um, you add it to Addo, you have one of the most diverse conservation areas, um, not just in South Africa, but in Africa. So a really special place. Okay, so how do we go through this process? Well, step one, we go out and collect scientific information. This is very important because we need baseline information on the area that you want to conserve. We need to know what is under the water and where do you find it? So how do you do that? Um, sand parks, we both commissioned and facilitated lots of research that fed into our planning. Some of the commissioned work include, uh, included research fishing, both from shore and boat, diving surveys, interviews with uh, fishermen, and, and um, sonar surveys of the reefs and bottom of the bay. And all of this fed into our species and habitat and fisheries baseline data for the MPA. Some of the projects we facilitated, we're very lucky here in Algar Bay, we have two uh, universities close by and several research institutions um, that can support us in conducting research in this area. We did a freshwater reserve determination for the Sunday's estuary. So that's looking at how much freshwater the estuary needs to function normally and, and perhaps even more optimally than it is now, as well as resource. So what do people do on the estuary? What fish do they catch? Where do they catch it, etc.? Uh, we also looked at fish larvae. One of the main objectives of this MPA was to conserve our overexploited lionfish. So we needed to know, is Algo Bay a good nursery area? Do we export all the larvae, um, et cetera? And of course, um, the whales and dolphins, I'm sure many of you have heard before that uh, Algo Bay is considered the dolphin capital of the world. We've also just recently been certified a whale heritage site. So really important in terms of how um, these animals use I'll go obey as a system. Uh, and then lastly, we looked at our reef invertebrates. So these reefs are very important for our reef fish communities. Um, and we needed to look at distribution um, and species composition. Okay, so now we have all of this information. What do we use? How do we use it? What do we do with it? Um, and we use systematic conservation planning. This is a standard international method um, for designing protected areas and what it does it optimizes the reserve design so that the highest biodiversity areas are conserved but yet we minimize the cost to society or your stakeholders. Um, systematic conservation planning is based on two principles of representativity and persistence. Now, it sounds very complicated, but in actual fact, it's quite simple. All it really says is that in this area that you're looking at for your reserve, you want to make sure that you conserve little bits of everything that is there. So um, specific habitats you want to cover and species. You also want to ensure that biological and ecological processes that happen in the area um, can persist into the future. So this is a very simplified explanation of the process. Um, so we use all that data and then we map it. So we map the biodiversity patterns, we map the ecological processes, as well as our socioeconomic data. In this case of Addo, it was mostly um, fishery, related data that we mapped. And then you set your targets. So you want to ensure to get that representativity. So you want to set targets for these different things that you've mapped. And then we use the systematic conservation planning software called MarkSan. So 
So if we look at the biodiversity patterns, now this is the data that we fed into our conservation plan. So, and a lot of this data came out of those um, research projects that I mentioned earlier, both from our facilitated research from the research institutions and from our own research work. Remembering that this area is big and the sea is expensive to work in and to access, we, used to ha we have to use proxies. So we need to use data as indicators um, for more than just what they are. So in this case, we're looking at reefs and you can see this is the outline of the proposed MPA at that stage. So this is the footprint. Here's Bird Island, St. Croix Island and Port Elizabeth is just sitting over here. Um, the blue is confirmed, confirmed reef, so that is our research surveys, either with camera work or diving, confirming this reef. Um, and the potential reef was through interviews with fishermen and divers. And this data served to, as both for the actual reef communities as well as our reef fish. Other stuff we looked at and fed in was the substrate. So this is the, the ocean bottom, the different types of material on the bottom. And you can see you can get uh, uh, the bay is mostly sand with some mud on this eastern, southeastern corner um, and a bit of gravel. We also looked at depths. Um, and you can see that the further away you move from the coast, the deeper it gets. Depth also um, influences the distribution of animals and plants. So it's important to take that into account. Then we also looked at the coastal classification. So this is essentially your coastal habitats, your shoreline. Is it a sandy beach? Is it a, a rocky cape? Is it a rocky shore? Is it an estuarine mouth? So we classified the whole of the shoreline um, in those different uh, ecosystems or habitats, sorry, um, and that went in. Then we also um, used the island habitats or ecosystems. And you can see that we, we define the ecosystem quite a bit bigger than the actual islands. So the terrestrial islands are those tiny little red dots in the middle of the green, um, but the actual uh, ecosystem around the island is quite a bit bigger. On the left-hand side here, we have some Koi Island. You can see it's quite a, a big rocky outcrop versus Bird Island over here, which is a very flat island. Um, and you can see the gannetry in front of the lighthouse. So these ecosystems are unique um, because they're largely formed by the guano runoff from these islands, and that provides nutrients for the surrounding coastline, and then these ecosystems develop. So some of the species we looked at, and I mentioned earlier that we were particularly concerned about our lionfish species, specifically because um, so many endemic species occur here. Um, and also we didn't include uh, all of the species that occur here, but key ones, key ones that are exploited, key ones that are overexploited. Um, important lionfish species, for both the shore fishery as well as the um, boat fishery. So the first one here is dusky cob. I'm sure most of you know that. Um, it is very overexploited. Unfortunately, there's very few left. And the reason is it's because it's such a lovely fish to eat. Um, so people target it. You can see the distribution. It's a coastal species. Um, it's also closely linked to estuaries. It's an estuarine-dependent species, which means 
some part of the life cycle is actually dependent on using the estuary. Um, this is the Learfish or Garrick, a game fish, but similarly to cob, it uses the, the very close to the coast sections as well as the estuary. It's another estuarine dependent fish, a large predatory fish, um, and the juveniles use the estuaries to recruit into. Similarly for the white steenbrus, um, also a coastal species, also dependent on estuaries, um, also overexploited, and is actually listed as endangered. So these were three coastal species um, that we fed specific data into. And then um, we also uh, looked at uh, Gilbert, which is a, considered a coastal species, I mean, sorry, an offshore species. Uh, you can see it occurs quite a bit further offshore uh, compared to the previous species that we covered, as well as silver cob. So these species, once again, are also overexploited. Um, they're mostly targeted by the boat um, fishery, not so much shore fishery. Then the last species we used was abalone. Um, the Eastern Cape is a, is a very important abalone area, for those who don't know. Um, and they used to occur a lot wider in the bay, um, but mostly now are still occurring around this Cape Receive area, um, around Bird Island and off the Cape Padrone area. So very limited distribution now. So then looking at some of the biodiversity processes, um, number one is the um, estuary process areas or the estuary miles. So I spoke about the fish and how they are dependent on the estuaries. We also rely on the estuaries to provide freshwater input into the marine environment, nutrients. There's also other um, exchanges such as crustaceans that migrate up and down, um, larvae come out and the larger ones move back in. So the estuary mouth is a, having that connectivity with the sea is a very important process that we want to ensure to continue into the future um, and it supports these ecosystems and, and species. Then, of course, penguins are very important, um, and this is the foraging areas. This is work that was done by Lorien and her research group. This is just two years' worth of, of data. They tag the penguins and then observe their foraging areas. You can see the Bird Island group. Um, they tend to forage and in a very similar area, whereas the St. Croix group uh, is quite diverse in their foraging area and they go quite far offshore out of the MPA footprint. Then one of the last processes we um, used is the diatom zone. This is when I mentioned earlier about the longest productive sandy beach. If you look at this photo, you can see the brownish orangey color in the waves, um, and that's the typical anolis diatom bloom, which then feeds the productivity in the bay. So all of this spatial data then gets processed by the Marksand software, and it brings out a map and it tells us where the high biodiversity areas are. So this is the footprint of the MPA, and you can see it's clustered around the island. So high biodiversity around Sequoia, Bird Island, um, the Capes, the inshore area where the fish uh, are distributed, as well as the estuary. Okay, so now that we know where our important biodiversity is, we also have to look at our social data. 
And as I mentioned, in the case of um, Addo, it was mostly fisheries activities. Um, and in Algo Bay, we have five uh, commercial fisheries and a fairly large recreational sector. So the first one is the squid or the chocker fishery, for those um, not quite sure. Uh, once again, to orientate you, this is the footprint of the MPA. Here is Port Elizabeth. And what I want you to focus on is the darker colors. So all of this data comes from the fishery department. Some of it's catch data, some of it's um, fishery effort data. But essentially, the darker blocks tell you where the, the higher catch or effort was put in. So you can see in the footprint, um, there's an area of importance at Sunday's mouth for the chocolate fishery. But most of the catches are actually outside of the MPA footprint. Um, the small pelagic persane fishery is the sardine fishery. Uh, so they have a very important fishery area right next to St. Croix in terms of the MPA footprint. Although a lot of their fishing, most of their, their fishing takes place outside of the MPA. Um, this obviously is, is quite a concern because we have the uh, penguins on the island which forage in those areas and our penguins are in direct competition with the sardine fishery. The trawl fishery um, catches hake and sole and you can see there's only a small overlap really on the southeastern end of, of the MPA footprint with most of the trawling taking place and actually missing the MPA footprint. Traditional lionfish, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, these are the um, commercial lionfishes. And you can see there's a concentration around the St. Croix area, but also on the rye banks and southern grounds, which is fishing areas outside of the, the MPA footprint. Then the last commercial fishery is the shark longline. Also quite a substantial effort within the MPA footprint, but once again, the higher catches and effort are outside of the, of the MPA footprint. Then if we look at the recreational fisheries, if you look at the boat-based one, which is at the bottom, there's a similar trend to the commercial boat-based line fisheries, which is an uh, important area around Bird Island, I mean, St. Croix Island, sorry, um, but also similarly with Rye Banks and the Southern Grounds and quite a bit more closer to the city of Port Elizabeth. The shore base is slightly different. Um, the effort and catches are mostly focused where you have access to the beach. So for um, instance, around the Sunday's mouth area and then closer to residential areas. So very important fishing areas here, closest to Port, Port Elizabeth um, and around the Cannon Rocks area um, on this side. So Markson then considers all this data, both the biodiversity as well as the fisheries data, and it gives us an optimized zonation. So allowing for the protection of the higher biodiversity areas, but also allowing for use in a balanced way. Um, so you can see the dark blue, that is our no take or restricted zones. And you can see these um, cover the high biodiversity areas around the islands, inshore, and then there is a, a no-take zone in the estuary. It's just a little bit too small to see. But it also allows for use. Um, and there's a large control zone in the middle where all fisheries are allowed, commercial as well as recreational. And you can see along the coast, these light blue 
lines, which allows for um, shore-based fishing and other resource use. So next we want to look at the cost to the industry. So if we zone as per marks and across the important biodiversity areas, what does this cost the industry? Um, and you can see there's a lot of uh, competition around the St. Croix area and that makes sense because quite a few of the estuary uh, of the um, fisheries had activities uh, and large catches from the Sunday's mouth um, and around the St. Croix area. You can see on the other restricted end though, much less conflict um, with most of the activities taking place in the coastal zone, which is zoned appropriately for that use. So we needed to find out what is the real impact on our stakeholders um, with the zonation of the MPA. And to do, to do that, we uh, commissioned a, a socioeconomic study. So we had to look at what are the losses in terms of, of rands and cents and catches by our fisheries with the zonation. And um, Anchor Environmental did the study for us. So what I want you to focus on here, we have the five commercial fisheries along the top from trawl, sardines, chocker, lionfish, and shark line lines. Um, and they looked at these fisheries in proportion of the region. So the inshore trawl fishery takes place across our coastline. So obviously we can't put the catches of Algoa Bay in, um, in comparison to the whole coastline's fishery. So we narrowed it down and looked at specifically the, uh, the Eastern Cape fishery and then in particularly the vessels that fished in this area and then worked um, out the proportion of catches and losses um, for these fisheries. So what I want you to focus on here, just in the red circle, is for those proposed no-take zones, this is the catch in tons that these various fisheries would lose, um, and this is put in percentage. And you can see it's fairly small percentages for the, for, for the fisheries around uh, between 0.3 uh, and 6% but slightly bigger for the shark long line um, at 20%. So this is just taking into account, you take away the catches in those areas. It does not take into account the fact that the fishers can move out of those um, areas and actually go fish somewhere else. Um, and during our process, this was actually validated by both the, the sardine fishery as well as the squid fishery, where they indicated to us that they um, could recoup those, those losses in areas outside of the NPA footprint. Then just in terms of gains, so we looked at possible gains from our stakeholders from this NPA. Um, and in terms of the traditional line fishery, if we had to close those restric restricted zones for 10 years and allow those lionfish stocks to rebuild um, and reseed the area adjacent, the catches and the, the value of the lion fishery would increase substantially. So theoretically, in 10 years' time, when those resources had time to recover, the traditional lionfish or the commercial lionfish fishery specifically would um, gain tremendously from this MPA, benefit from the MPA. Okay, so stakeholders. So a lot of what you see here are engagements that happened in those, those iterations. So you collect your science, um, 
you verify with scientists, you collect your fisheries data, you verify with your um, fishery sector. Um, and we did several iterations of those. We also engaged the Sunday's Estuary Ratepayers Association, um, other large key stakeholders such as the Kucha Development Corporation, Transnet, Petra SA, um, um, the oil and gas sector, the general public of PE. So by the end of 2013, um, we had conducted almost 40 official engagements, and I'm go not going to repeat them all there. They, they're all there for you to see. But essentially, it was an annual engagement with all of our key stakeholders. Um, including government, so the fisheries department, both the scientists and the managers, um, the environmental department, managers, scientists, all the surrounding communities, all the resource users, um, other conservation agencies, etc. So at, at the end of 2013, as I said, we've had about 40 odd engagements. In comes Operation Pakisa. So Operation Pakisa was a presidential initiative and it was designed to fast track the implementation um, of the National Development Plan. So Pakisa means hurry up in um, Sutu, say Sutu, and uh, it was driven by the president to deliver outcomes within a two-year period. So there was a large pressure um, to deliver. However, before this started, as with ADDO, there were other MPA planning initiatives on the go. Uh, one of these was the offshore MPA project by Kerry Singh from Sanby, a Namakwa planning initiative, which was a combination um, Sanby collaboration with Sandbox, WWF, and the department, um, and then also the KZN MPAs, which was led by um, EKZN Wildlife. So a lot of work was done before Pakisa, but all of this fed into um, these Pakisa labs. So this was a participation by all the marine sectors. So the oil and gas sector, fishery sector, aquaculture, and then ocean governance and protection, and that's the, the lab that the MPA sat in. So during this process, there were several iterations, and there was discussions between all of these sectors, uh, negotiations, and um, the MPAs went through various sizes and designs um, in, in these labs. At the end of this process, each of the ministers responsible for these different sectors had to sign off. And that gave support to MPAs on a national level, which led our Minister of Environment to be able to gazette these proposed MPAs for uh, public comment. And this happened in 2016. Um, this led to a national stakeholder engagement around the coast, and we received more than 700 comments on all 20 of these MPAs, it was substantial and we had to reply to each of those. Finally, the Minister gazetted these um, MPAs, including ADDO, in 2019. So ADDO MPA was considered one of the most extensive stakeholder engagements um, done for a South African MPA. And um, we were very happy to have the MPA declared. And this is the final declaration. And you can see there's some changes in the boundary. Those were final negotiations after the comments. And this is for allowing other um, economic activities such as aquaculture and, and bunkering operations. So if we reflect on this process a little bit, conservation takes time. 
it took 13 years um, to get these 20 MPAs declared. It takes resources and dedication and endurance, not just by you as a project leader, but by your team, your organization, and your stakeholders. It's a long process. Stakeholders get exhausted. Conservation is about managing people, not necessarily biodiversity. So you need to build your relationships and build trust with your stakeholders. Let them speak and learn to listen about, listen to their issues and their concerns. Um, you need to be patient and transparent. Stakeholders do not forget. You need to try and find a balance. Conservation is contentious um, and you are bound to make someone unhappy, whether it's on the conservation side for not doing enough or on the stakeholder side for taking a, away too much. So you have to find that balance. Development, unfortunately, doesn't wait uh, for these long processes. And, and in many cases, they overtake the conservation initiatives, um, which are hard lessons to learn. Science changes. So also during this very long period and all of this work put in into planning these MPAs, our science evolved. And we have so much more new information now. Um, just to give you an example. So in 2006, 20, 2006, 2007, when we started this process, we did not have a habitat map of our ocean. Uh, and to put that in perspective, the first vegetation or habitat map for the terrestrial part of South Africa was completed in the modern era certainly in uh, 1936 already. So you can see how far marine science lag. Um, but this process really gave science a boost. Um, and here you can see uh, one of the newer maps from um, the 2018 National Biodiversity Assessment. So we now have a fairly comprehensive um, habitat or ecosystem map for our coast. So what are the next steps? Um, obviously, we now have 20 MPAs on paper. We need to now implement them. We need resources. You need vessel use, vessels. You need staff, but staff with skills, staff with passion and dedication. It's not easy working in the ocean. Um, we need equipment. We need operational budget, management plans. You need to do monitoring to ensure that your, your objectives are monitored and implemented. So for the, for the coastal MPAs, um, we have some management in place, uh, particularly some of the co coastal conservation agencies like EKZN Wildlife and Isi Mangaliso, and then Sand Parks. But what do we do with those uh, 14 offshore new MPAs? Um, they require substantially different um, views on management. They need large ships, sophisticated surveillance systems, and um, substantially larger budgets. So some implementation challenges from a sandbox side, just to close off Edo. Of course, lack of funding. As an organization that is tourism revenue based, it's very hard. Um, having lost all that revenue now in COVID times. There's lack of capital budgets, so we can't replace vessels. Um, we can't build staff accommodation for, co for staff on the coast. There's increasing pressures, um, uh, specifically poaching for high value species like abalone on the west coast, the rock lobster. And we sit with major declines in key species like the African penguins. And, and this is due to a combination of factors, but mostly lack of prey due to climate change, industrial activities, competition with fisheries. And then, yeah, things that I've mentioned before, the increased development and industrial activities right on the boundaries of the MPA. And I think that what, something that's been very topical recently, particularly as the uh, seismic surveys. I think you're all, uh, all aware of those. In Algoa Bay, we have shipping and we have bunkering, which is 
increased uh, the risk to the penguins substantially. So what can you do to support your local MPA? Well, I think step number one is to find your local MPA. Do you know what it's called, what its donation is, what its regulations are? Get involved or organize a beach cleanup. Um, you can make choices in what you eat. Look up SASE um, and the MSC certification. When you're going to Willie's or Pick and Pay, pick the, the sustainably certified products. You can report illegal activities in your MPA or just in general around the coast. Recycle your plastic. But I think for me, the most important bit is our future, and that is our kids. Teach your kids to have love and respect for nature because without future conservationists, we won't have um, MPAs or conservationists to look after them. So thank you very much. Happiness is once your MPA has actually been declared. Thank you so much. And I thank you very much. I think your middle name must be Patience to have gone through <laughs> all of that work <laughs> to get that. I don't think any of us realized how um, the, the massive amount of work that goes on in the background to get these things done. So thank you to, to you and to everybody who's involved in getting MPAs up and running for us because we do need them. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Willie Engelbrecht, who's going to play question master for us. So, Vili, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and thank you very much, Anai, for a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, quite, a, quite a few questions, and I'm going to post them one, one by one and allow you to, um, to respond um, to them. So, um, the first question we got um, uh, is from a... I think he's an ex ex honorary ranger. He immigrated to um, to England, uh, Graham Down, and he, he's got um, he's got basically two questions. Um, his question is the gannet tree on Bird Island. Is it larger than that of the Ichabu Islands uh, of Namibia? And also that goes hand in hand with that. Uh, is it also larger than the the northern gannets you find on the on Bass Rock in Scotland? Thank you, Vili. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it is the the largest in in the world. Yeah, so bigger than those two other colonies. Thanks, Anai. Maybe I can just add that I had the opportunity to visit. Uh, the Ichabu Islands in Namibia, and they are actually more famous for the Cape Cormorant population than gannets. I think uh, when we were there, the conservationists informed us that Ichabu Islands in Namibia, it's 12 islands, houses uh, almost 60% of the world population of Cape Cormorant, just as a matter of interest. Then I've got a question from Phil Radford, which is maybe not um, MPA related, but uh, certainly in your field. And uh, I'm going to see if you're biased or not. The question is, uh, which university is recommended to study marine biology and science? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Well, we, we have a few universities that um, that offer those types of courses. And here in the Eastern Cape, of course, it's Rhodes University um, and Nelson Mandela University, but also UCT um, does good courses. So I, I think it depends on which sort of side of marine biology you're interested in. If you're more interested in fish, then Rhodes University, they have the... They are the fish specialists, so I would recommend that. Um, but any of the other, I think, is is good to go to for a general marine um, course, yes. Thanks, Anne. I was just waiting for that Nelson Mandela Bay 
because I know that you, uh, maybe you still are, uh, associate professor at the prof at the best last TV. <laughs> and then um, I've got a question from Colin. Uh, will we be able to get an email copy of this presentation? Um, so, Peter, I don't know if you want to, or Deline wants to come in here. Would it be possible to get an email presentation of the uh, presentation? Um, that, that would obviously be up to Anae whether she wants to share her presentation with us um, because it is a PowerPoint presentation. There, there, there obviously will be a recording available. Um, but if, um, if Anae is happy to share her presentation, um, we will um, share, it via, we'll share it via a link with Rita that people can go to her or email her or email me and we'll pass it on. So I know that the answer to that question is entirely up to you. Thanks. You know, it's unfortunately a fairly large uh, presentation. So I'll, I'll see what I can do um, to make it available over email. Yeah, you can, you can, you can send it to me via WeTransfer and then I'll just send people a link that they can then download it if it's too big for emails. Sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Anne. And then um, we've got a question from Beverly Elliott. What, what scientific input or commentary has St. Parks had regarding the current seismic surveys? Uh, sorry, Vili, you broke up there for a moment. Uh, Anne, uh, the question is what scientific input or commentary as Sandparks had regarding the current seismic surveys that Shell does on our coast. Thanks, Vili. Um, we have commented previously on seismic surveys, specifically where they were close to some of our MPAs. So in the past, we've commented um, on surveys close to uh, Titicama MPA, close to Agalis and Table Mountain MPA, as well as in Addo. So it depends on where these surveys take place. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, um, Hanay. Then there's quite a few questions uh, left. So Francois Kloppers asked, yeah, how do we know we can trust the labels of sustainable caught seafood in shops? Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, I think there are some checks and balances in place um, to ensure that there is some form of um, accountability with, with these labeling systems. Um, I think it comes down to you and personal choice. Um, if you know a species is overexploited, um, it's your choice whether you eat it or not. Um, and I don't think you have to have labels to make that decision for yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, or, you can, or you can go, Francois, you can go out and catch it yourself. You are in France Crown next week, so bring your, bring your fishing rod with. <laughs> uh, then um, we've got a... Um, We've got a, a interesting question from Jay Malharba asking you, will rising sea levels impact on our MPAs? Um, yes, they will to some extent. Um, along our coast, it's not my field, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, in, in future, it certainly will in, in areas, in certain areas. Um, not just sea level rise, but also the increased storminess. So more storms, bigger storms, more often. Um, in Titicama, for instance, we are already struggling with infrastructure along the coast because of, of increased storms. So it depends on, on the type of environment. Um, if you have lots of infrastructure from an MPA uh, point, you might be more susceptible. If you have an MPA that has a mangrove coast, like some of the MPAs along the Trans High Coast, 
you might have a slightly better buffer in terms of, of sea level rise. So it really is um, context specific, but certainly in future, it will, it will, we will feel it. Okay, thanks, Arne. Um, uh, then we received an email by uh, a question by email from Max. Uh, he's got two questions. The one is when creating a marine protected area, what aspects are considered? Example, do you look at species found there, whether or not the species are on CITES, what uh, tops list, is it based on geographic location? And do you consider local fisheries as well? For example, if there are local fisheries within the region of the MPA, do you allow regulated fishery? So I, I, I personally believe that you, you have actually answered this question unless you want to add something. No, no, I, I think my, um, my presentation addressed all of those issues. Yeah. Okay, uh, then we're going to go back to, um, to uh, questions received uh, on the webinar. Um, well done on your marine park establishment. It's from Stephen Floyd. A recent, a recent query in Cape Town. Uh, is there a detailed agreed plan to effectively manage the Cape Peninsula Marine Park? And where can this plan be obtained? Okay, so the Cape Peninsula MPA is actually called the Table Mountain um, MPA. And that is currently managed by the Table Mountain National Park. So the management of that MPA is covered under the actual park management plan. Um, with these new MPAs, we, we have to develop management plans for each of them. But also going forward, the, the current MPAs that are managed under our park plans, we will actually develop separate management plans for those MPAs to make sure they, they get the attention um, that they deserve. But that's going to happen going forward. So for any information about the Table Mountain MPA, um, he can access the Sandparks website. There is a, um, a tab where you can go find park plans, approved park plans, and under the Table Mountain National Park plan, there should be information on the MPA. And I thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, just a, a question that is related to that, to that, and it comes from Dudley Vessels. And uh, Dudley lives in Koinas, just adjacent to uh, the Namakwa National Park. And uh, HR that's very involved in that park, both him and his wife. Um, and his question is, uh, taken into consideration that, um, that the Namakwa National Park uh, Park Management Plan was written almost uh, nine years ago. So that was before the establishment of the MPA. His question is, where could one get info on the Namakwa National Park MPA and is it available somewhere? Yes. So at the end of my presentation on the last page, there was a couple of websites um, for more information. So this, you can go to the Sandparks website. Um, we have MP, our three MPAs are covered there under a page. So there will be more information about Namakwa. Um, there's also a very nice uh, website called Marine Protected Areas um, of South Africa. And it covers all of the MPAs in South Africa, including Namakwa. So there will be more information on that too. Oh, thank you. That's excellent. So I'm sure that, um, Dudley, you can get it there. Then from Taryn, uh, thank you for an excellent talk and well done on uh, the extensive work involved. And I think a, a question is relevant to many other questions that, uh, that were asked. Uh, being not a fenced area, how does one protect the processes that are involved within the ecological functioning of the MPA? For example, catchment, mismanagement, or poor water quality in the marine environment. Yeah, that is that's one of our challenges. Um, because MPAs are influenced by so many things that happen outside of it. Um, 
catchment management is, is one example. So the freshwater input uh, that comes from a mountainous area down the river into the estuary and into the marine environment. As a MPA management authority, you do not have authority um, to make decisions about issues that impact you upstream. Um, so that is a co-management issue that's a really practically difficult thing to do. Um, uh, safeguarding some of the ecological processes are possible. So for instance, keeping or ensuring that an estuary mouth stays open um, or in its natural state at least. So that is something more manageable because it's within your realm of, of management. So the issues really are dependent on whether it's an external issue, something that's managed by a different department or whether it's within your realm of, of management. Thanks, Anay. Then we've got a question from Michael Moore, and I'm very tempted to answer it myself, but I'm going to leave it to you. How does Sandparks plan to manage MPAs such as those in the West Coast National Park without suitable vessels? Uh, now, I know it's a management problem. Maybe, uh, maybe part of the answer should be, uh, Michael, you guys must uh, make more money and buy a vessel for Sandparks uh, through that. To the HRs, but I'm going to leave it to you, Anna, yeah, Anna, if you want to add something. Yeah, thank you. Um, the realistic problems that we sit and that we face um, is that we really, really are struggling financially. Um, and marine equipment is, is not cheap. Um, and you have to replace your equipment regularly. Vessels should be... Um, replaced every three to five years. And, and especially now, Sandparks receives 80% of its budget from its tourism income. Uh, so that makes it really difficult. Um, where do we find capital for these replacement items? Uh, we get 20% of our funding from government. So it is really a really difficult um, issue that we, that we struggle with. And it's not just us, it's all of the conservation agencies and whether it's a, a boat on the ocean or, you know, a Land Rover for, for a national park. The issues are similar. Well, I thank you, Anaya. I know that the, the HRs are very uh, aware of that. And um, I know that uh, I know that the ADO uh, SHRs um, donated uh, a boat not to too many years ago. I'm sure it's due for replacement now, but you know that we we are very aware of your situation and we we want to give you the assurance that we will do our utmost to, uh, to try and assist wherever we can. Then William Elliott uh, asked a question, what is the status of other proposed MPAs? Um, maybe, maybe just add to that, um, are there any other proposed MPAs awaiting approval and what is this, what are the status on them? Sure, at the moment the short answer is no. Um, really because this process took so long and, and so much effort to conclude and we've just uh, declared 20 new MPAs, that's something significant. We've never had that before in our history. So um, at the moment there isn't any planned or in pending proposed MPAs. There is, however, planning towards um, larger conservation targets. So South Africa, in, as an international obligation, subscribes to a whole lot of international um, commitments on conservation. And um, we, as a country, are supposed to be conserving, you know, depending on which target you look, 10% of your, of your ocean or your country, or 30% of your ocean of your country. So there is planning and research towards where we should be looking for the next um, 5%, but there's nothing on the cards yet in terms of, of specific MPAs and um, declaring them. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anay. Uh, Peter, they, uh, you know, as we go along the questions, uh, are coming in, um, are we good to, 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 to handle another five? 
if if Anais sure. happy to answer another five, we're right, we're good. Okay, cool. And then so, I'll send her the list of questions afterwards, and if she wants to answer them, she's by email. She's welcome to. Okay, cool. So um, uh, Anai, Marty, uh, Marty Jasper, um, he's got a very interesting question. Please tell us about whales and dolphins, etc., beaching along beaches in the MPA. How frequently uh, this has happened over the period of your research and whether since the MPA has been in place, uh, has this occurrence uh, redu uh, has it reduced? since the proclamation of the MPA? Sure, that's quite a hard question. Um, but in short, the MPA has been the, I don't think long enough for us to make a correlation on, on whether the MPA is protecting the cetaceans um, in the area or not, um, in terms of strand, observing it through strandings, certainly. Um, there are regular strandings. We have whales that come out with ship strikes um, or disease. Uh, we had quite a big stranding of dolphins about uh, six, seven years ago, um, and we weren't sure of, of the cause of it. So, so they do happen, um, and uh, there are stranding networks um, and scientists monitoring this, but in terms of the MPA and the declaration and whether that's, you know, created any sort of protection in buffering these things, it's too short to tell. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then we've got, uh, we, we've got uh, a question about terrestrial animals. I see there's a question uh, someone asked you, are the elephants in the dunes? I suppose that's that uh, dune field north of Colchester. <laughs> but there's also a question um, relating terrestrial um, animals. Um, I just want to find it. Uh, saying, uh, are there any studies done on how inland population of our freshwater resources are impacting on MPAs? There is definitely studies um, that has looked at that issue. Is, there isn't a lot. Um, in the case of uh, Addo and the Alexandra Dunefield Aquifer, we do have some evidence. Um, the local communities, local uh, municipalities on the eastern side um, of the MPA um, do extract water from the aquifers in the dunes. And we know that those uh, aquifers do have salt intrusion. So the water is getting saltier and saltier, the, the fresh water that they're pumping out. So there's definitely impact um, you know, in certain areas, depending on the, the use and the extraction, volume extraction of the water. So definitely impacts, yes. Thanks. And then the last question and, and one comment. Um, the, the question comes from, uh, they, uh, just by the way, Anay, there are so many compliments on your, uh, on your presentation. And I'm sure Peter will, Peter will deal with that as well. Um, there's you. one from, uh, from Andre Geldenhuis. Um, he says, yeah, Shopra Checkers has a brand called Cape Point. The label also state that it is a product of China. From being an MPA, is this legal on uh, on many labels? I suppose um, not sure exactly what the point is, but maybe you can uh, you can answer his question for him. Sure, I I'm, I don't know that brand, and I, I'm not a, aware of it. Um, so maybe something we can we can look into. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, uh, just uh, for last from my side, I just want to make a comment because you know Mike uh, Moore, um, one of our HRs, very involved in the West Coast uh, National Park. Um, when I say to him, yeah, they must not buy the boat for West Coast, his comment is, how about a Lofi's Dry boat for West Coast? Now, Lofi's Dry is a boat <laughs> camp in... Uh, in, in the Khalakhari. So, uh, 
Well, uh, Mike, if you guys can sponsor a Boro for Lofi's Dry, I'm sure we can we can talk about the boat for uh, the boat for West Coast. Be that as it may, I know that's all from my side. Thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over back to Peter. Thank you, Billy. Thank, thanks, Billy. Um, yes, they were, they, to, to those whose questions didn't get answered, I will I will send the Q and A file to Anna, and she can. Um, Answer some by by via email um, from to Anate from from us. Thank you very much for for, the, for for your time and for a really interesting presentation. I'm sure that none of us realise the amount of work that goes into these things. We just see something that says oh, 20 MPAs have been gazetted, and we don't realise that for the last 20 years people have been looking at this and working at it and talking to one another. Um, and as you say, you have to not only talk to your stakeholders, you have to listen to what they say and understand what they what their what their problems are. So from the honorary rangers, thank you very, very much for for the presentation. It really was great. Thank you. So and for our, our next um, webinar, which is on the 9th of March, you will re remember Petronel Nevo who gave us a talk on, on rhinos before. She's now going to give us another talk on rhino, a baby rhino and a baby zebra that have formed a bond and the first rhino that she's had born in, in her um, sanctuary. So that, that'll be an interesting one on the 9th of March. Um, and for those of you who don't know about the honorary rangers, we're, we're a registered non-profit and public benefit organization um, mandated with a memorandum of understanding with Sand Parks, and as such, we issue tax relief certificates for donations, whether they're monetary or in kind. And all the donations we receive go to projects identified by Sand Parks, which are all managed through a wish list system. So, um, I'm sure that, uh, as Billy said, Mike, Mike will start looking. West Coast will start looking at some some way of raising money to to uh, to have a boat because I know they've got. Malchas and various places there that they need to look after. So um, all donations are gratefully received. And uh, whether you're donating 50 rand or 5,000 rand, or if you happen to if you happen to be one of those billionaire people, just add a few zeros. We really don't mind. So Anae, once again, thank you very much to everybody who joined us. Thank you very much. Um, just I don't know if you had a chance to notice it, Anae. We were. At, I think 350 viewers at one stage. So you were very popular and you did exceedingly well. So once again from us, thank you to you and to all your staff that helped put this together. And thank you to everybody who watched tonight. Please join us again on the 9th of March. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Good Thanks. night, everyone. Good night.